So I showed you earlier that uh, nearly 90% of papers are rejected. But the rejection rate is only 10% for letters to the editor. So this is the advice that exists on my <coughs> Facebook page. My advice is that you should take a recent journal article that is important because the letter to the editor for an article published last year will not be attractive to the to the journal take a recent it is inevitable that any article has some weakness pick up that weakness and use that weakness to construct your letter and within a couple of weeks of submitting your letter, you will find that it is accepted for publication. And within a few weeks after that, it will appear in PubMed as a citation. So all 42 of you who are attending this uh, session uh, 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 can, within a period of a month, all put a smile on your face with two lines with your name appearing in PubMed. What do you do? You write the, for, in the following way. The first line starts with giving a reference to the article. You will say something like, I read this article with the reference given with interest. And say something positive about it. It, is, it addresses an important health condition that is prevalent now you have already started with a positive uh, as far as the author and the editor is concerned next you write what is it that you think was annoying weak or something that triggered you to write the letter that could be a weakness in blinding. It could be a weakness in follow-up. It could be a weakness in objectivity of outcome measure. Any one of these items could be the source or the trigger for writing this letter. You then say a few words about how this thing that triggered you to write the letter creates a problem, creates a difficulty in interpretation. Describe what the difficulty is. Give some references to back your argument with respect to the difficulty. So this type of a weakness identified by you, reported in a positive way, backed by references, will be taken positively by the editor. And in the last sentence, you simply conclude by saying that you would like to see the response of the author uh, with respect to the point you have highlighted because hopefully it will help clarify for other readers in the future as to how the paper could be better interpreted. Then just add your name and affiliation. Use grammar check and spell check. Go to the website of the journal and upload your manuscript and then that's it that's your letter to the editor i can offer to read and comment on a letter to the editor written by any of you um, after this session is over right so i hope that addresses the question concerning a letter to the editor Well, if you cannot find the original source, you should not cite. You should not cite something where you have not been able to assess the original source. So that was one of the questions. Uh, well, 
is there any other alternate way? Well, what can I say? If there is a, something that exists in reality, well, you keep looking for it till you find it or use another citation for which the original source is available to you. I, I, I hope that helps uh, Muhammad Saftar. Is it acceptable to frequently cite the same researcher that we mentioned in the introduction? Well, look, the issue of citation in the literature of the literature in the introduction and the discussion is that these citations have be re, have to be related to your work. So it is inevitable that whatever you cite in the introduction is suitable for also citing in the discussion. The only difference is that you, you cite different elements of the same paper. So the introduction would normally deal with methods of the previous, or of the previous study, whereas the discussion would deal with results of the previous study. Or another aspect, uh, comment made by the author in their own discussion that could be, uh, or a letter written about that paper by another researcher could be a citation. This the story develops, a, but it has to develop around your own topic. So unless your topic has a zillion citations. Um, but in any case, <clears throat> relevant citations would very likely appear both in introduction and discussion. Then another question is, would it be advisable? As ah, you also in the previous question, the you are concerned about repetition. So look, we are not writing a novel. We are writing science. Here, repetition is expected. For example, when you are writing your methods and results, <clears throat> it is expected that it is written in the abstract. It's also expected that it is also written in the method section and the results section. It's also expected that the results sections also appear in the tables and figures. Then it's also expected that the same results appear again in discussion and the methods and your comments on the methods also appear again in discussion. So the repetition is the name of the game in this type of writing. So please don't be afraid of <coughs> repeating the citations. <coughs> Except you just have to be careful that you're not repeating the same idea or exactly the same words. I mean, even repetition of exactly the same words is permitted between abstract and main text. So please don't be fearful of repetition in writing. Next question is, would it be advisable to mention every limitation of our study in the discussion? Or will that decrease our chances of acceptance? Uh, if you do not mention the limitations of your study, that will decrease the chances of getting accepted. The editors are usually experienced researchers. They know that no study is conducted without any flaw. Every study has some flaw. So it makes no sense for you as an author not to talk about a flaw of your study, which the editor expects to read about he will be, or she will be disappointed if this information is missing. So please talk about the, your limitations. <clears throat> but as I explained in my slides, <clears throat> give them a positive ending. You say this is a problem, but then you also explain how you interpret this in light of what you have found or what you have done.
Okay, there's another question about how, how important is it to take permission before using a tool? Not all tools need permission. I mean, what, what, <clears throat> what permissions are needed? Well, basically you just, uh, when a paper is already published, it's in the public domain. If you cite the source, then you can use the tool. There is no, there's no problem with it unless the tool states that it is copyrighted and the permission of the copywriter should be obtained. In that case, you will need to write to whoever the copyright holder is. Uh, well, if they are retired or dead, well, you still just write the email. You may not get any answer or you might get an answer from the person to whom they have transferred the copyright. But your task as an author is to seek the permission. The fact that they never replied to you is their fault. It's not your responsibility to reply on their behalf. So when you submit your paper, you can say to the editor, I sought the permission as was required, but I did or did not get the answer depending on what happened. <clears throat> Well, you definitely should need, would need to cite another, uh, the original source of the scale or the survey that used from another author. If nothing else, it will show that you respect other authors and that will be taken well uh, by the editors, that you are respecting of other people in your own field of research. That was a question by Dr by Aziza. I, ho I hope my answer addresses your uh, question. I think with that I've come to the end of the chat list, the questions in the chat. <clears throat> Are there any questions that were sent to you in the email, that were sent to me by email that I have failed to cover so far? Let's have a look at the email. <clears throat> well, the question about the second question, well, this one about what aspect of research made me think about becoming a researcher? <clears throat> Is for me, the applied part of research, that with research you can immediately and effectively make a difference to the lives of hundreds and thousands of people, is what was most attractive to me. I think on this question I have already advised that I believe systematic reviews are a <clears throat> good way to go at your stage in the career. Concerning in polishing your manuscript writing skills. Well, use some of the tricks I've given you with respect to introduction and discussion. Use the checklists in the equator for writing methods and results. And read a lot of papers, not just to read about what is it that is reported, but how it is written. Well, I see what you are saying, renowned doctors. I mean, what is renown? I don't know what is renown. But I, I understand what you mean. You mean people who you look up to appear not to give research importance. Is that what is meant, I presume? Well, 
what can I say? I mean, <clears throat> you, you realize that you can be more right than your teachers. A student can in time be better than their teachers. If these people don't give importance to something that is important, that does not mean that you just have to follow what they deliver to you. You can develop your own image, opinion, ideas, work with them and keep going to do stuff in which you believe. <clears throat> the only one, the only person you are responsible for, the only person whose actions and beliefs and thoughts and activity and effort you are responsible is yourself you are not responsible for for what your teacher believes if you believe that research is a good thing to do then don't worry about what other people believe even if they are your teachers you take responsibility for your own belief you take responsibility for acting according to your belief As a known clinician, well, the good news is some of the most important health researchers are in fact known clinicians. So the idea that you have to be a doctor in order to be a good researcher or a nurse to be a good researcher does not apply. Good research is delivered by good research methods, not by clinical training. I hope that addresses this point about uh, non-clinician. Uh, the question also is, how do I gain hands-on hands -on practice in research at international level? Well, if you uh, think about doing a systematic review, Like a, a systematic review, a research project is, any research project is ideally suitable for a team effort. One person cannot do a whole research project. They usually need to work with others. Maybe you can find others who you work with abroad. That could start to create your international um, links. I believe on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, there are already platforms for clinical trials, for, for research students, for systematic reviews. Enter those platforms. I wrote my first email in 1994. This was six years after graduating from medical school. I did not have the opportunity to be able to do an international research project while being a medical student. You have that opportunity today. Grab, the, grab that opportunity. That opportunity does not require you to have your hand held by your teacher. You can just take the initiative and go forward. People exist like you, who you will find via social media. These groups already exist. We already talked about this plagiarism we have talked about. How do I know the manuscript is of a standard level for publishing? Well, check what you have written against the checklist available in the equator guidelines. So if you're writing a review, use the Prisma checklist. If it's a trial, use the consort checklist. If it's an observational study, use the stroke checklist. Then you will know. <clears throat> 
Can research be done without data collection? Yes, of course, research can be done without data collection. If you mean data collection from patients, then the answer is yes. You can do research by collecting data from published papers. How to write a letter? I think we've covered that. How to find the time to do research? Hmm. Well, that's to me a question of priority. Anything that you prioritize, you can find time for it. You cannot change that a day has 24 hours, but you can change your priority. So if you prioritize research, you will find time within the 24 hours available in a day. Then there is also a question related to how different is participating in research abroad compared to Pakistan? Uh, this is to some extent a difficult question for me to answer now because of two reasons. Number one, I may have traveled 37 countries to teach about research, but there are more than 200 countries in the world. And it's not necessary that my experience can address the question as put to me. I think I can generally say that for people studying medicine or nursing, research is not given a high priority. A small proportion of us usually based on our own initiative, become interested and then go forward with it. And then again, based on our own initiative, develop more training, understanding and career in this direction. And I presume the same is true for colleagues in Pakistan. So that's... Uh, so the second reason why I could not give an answer properly is that I have not been in Pakistan now, working in Pakistan now for many years. So I believe the culture in Pakistan itself has changed compared to the time when I was a student and a doctor. Um, it may be of interest for you to know that amongst low middle income countries, Pakistan has the highest per capita output of science published. The second country after Pakistan is Egypt and then there are others. So I am proud as a Pakistani to present this information whenever I have a chance to talk about how low middle income countries are investing in research. I think Pakistan in the last 10 years has a landscape for research completely different and extremely advanced relative to 30 years ago when I was just completing my internship. So I think you are growing up in a country where the environment for research exists and is far better than the past generations. But what are your own comments about what I just said? How do you feel about your environment concerning research? Please feel free to make comments. I promise to keep them confidential. Um, someone in the chat, uh, Mahin, she actually says that it's mostly quantity over quality. So I guess what she might mean to say is that a bunch of papers are being churned out, but what's really important from that paper is like, is the content of those papers even good? Is what 
what's being produced even worthwhile and important to the research community? Uh, look, my comment in response is, if you are interested in research, then you give the importance to quality. You have the power in your own hand and in the team around you to change this. And this problem of quantity over quality is not a unique problem for Pakistan. 90% of the papers published in the Lancet have no clinical value whatsoever. Only a very small proportion of papers have the quality with which applied clinical practice can be improved. So this statement, please don't use this statement of quantity over quality to beat yourself up. CV boosting activity. Well, you don't, Mahin, you don't have to be the one who does the CV boosting activity. You can be the one who really want to understand and focus on the things that when published will change practice. I'll give you an example. Uh, about 15 years ago, we did a study on uh, how to detect congenital heart disease in the newborn. The study was very simple. Use pulse oximetry of the newborn to check the level. And if the level is low, do additional tests to check if they have a congenital heart disease. Turned out to be a fantastic good screening test. Today, it is part of the national policy of many countries many, many countries and is driven and this policy decision is driven by the research we did in our group in Birmingham. In addition, other people also did research in this field. But ours was one of the largest studies that pushed the agenda forward. Do this type of study. This is what you're talking about, Mahin, isn't it? Get quality, get large numbers of patients, and this is how you make an impact. Mahin, do you want to unmute your mic and say something in word? I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. In the meantime, somebody commented, uh, Nakash Heather, about 7% of plagiarism on Turn It In. I think 7% is not very high. You don't need to worry about it. This will be okay. Should I proceed? You, yes, you can proceed with submission. Please go ahead. 7% is okay. Uh, was, did Maheen wanted to say something? Um, Maheen, I think I unmuted you. Oh, yeah, please uh, go ahead, Maheen. Hold on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Khalid. It was wonderful and I learned quite a lot. Um, and I absolutely agree. The quality, uh, the quantity over quant quality is a problem everywhere in the world. Um, I'm just worried because now, um, especially for our generation, research has become such an important thing to have on your CV for residency or even to move up the ladder to be taken seriously in the medical field that I believe that it's not being given the importance that maybe was given earlier on. It's no longer about passion. It's more about it being a prerequisite to actually be in a position in the future where you would be taken seriously. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, it makes sense. Look, the Student Research Forum did not exist 30 years ago when I was 35 years ago when I was a student at AKU. Now you have a forum. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised that people at student level are so enthusiastically engaging in research. And I was surprised not because it's happening in Pakistan, where people don't necessarily associate it with a country with development in research. I was surprised because this level of engagement you have is much higher than the ones 
I have seen in Birmingham and London. So I congratulate you and the organizers of this forum. Uh, it is correct that some things become a tick box and without it, without ticking those boxes, it's not possible to move forward in your profession. But that does not mean that uh, we should engage in research only in order to tick the box. We should engage in research because we want to make a difference. This is, this is the way I would suggest we should look at it. Absolutely agreed. Um, and I also think there's this strong belief that when you do research, it has to turn into a paper. Um, sometimes people invest a lot of time in research and they do not get any significant results out of it, um, but it's still a worthwhile investment. I think that's another belief that needs to be challenged a little bit. But I understand that unless it's on your CV, you can't really show the work that you've done. So that, that's another- well, let, me, let me just make a comment about that, uh, Mahin. Studies that have negative findings are also publishable. So just because your result is not positive, actually does not mean that you should not publish. I take it even one step further. If you are doing research, with ethical permission and other regulatory approvals, I believe you have an ethical obligation to publish regardless of what your result is. Because if your negative finding is an important negative finding, you prevent other people from doing the same study, which will turn out to be negative in other places. So do not equate the positivity of your finding with the ability to get published. The ability to get published should be and is frequently linked to the strengths of the methods of the study. It's not linked to the positivity of the findings. I, 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 ho I hope that gives you encouragement to encourage others to publish their papers even when their findings are not positive. Yes, that's, that's very useful feedback. Sometimes the research isn't going in a certain direction and you still invested time and learned a lot, but you can't put it into a manuscript form. What, what suggestions would you have um, if someone's experiencing that situation? Well, my advice is start publishing your protocols. You don't have to wait for the results to start publishing. There are many journals that publish protocols of studies and these are indexed. So as soon as your ethical approval is obtained, immediately start thinking about submitting the manuscript to a journal because you could not get ethical approval without writing your protocol. That protocol can now be refined and populated with references and submitted to a journal for publication. I believe there is even a place for you to ask the dean that AKU should invest in preparing its own journal. New England Journal of Medicine is a journal of a place in New England. And New England is a smaller city than the city of Karachi. AKU has more students, Pakistan, Karachi has more medical schools than New England has. The prospect of producing work that should be publishable through a recognized quality journal, possibly set in Karachi at AKU, uh, I mean, why should it be a foreign idea? This should be the natural next step in development. It's another comment, Mahin, you say, without significant result to back the protocol, would a journal even consider it worthy of publishing? Uh, protocol is about what you are going to do. Therefore, there is no significant result. Well, there is no result, whether significant or not available, 
at the time of submitting your protocol for publication. So just to give you an example, I am advising as member of the COVID committee in Pakistan, a group in Lahore, who are running a randomized control trial. The results are not yet available, but their protocol is already published. It's cited in PubMed. If you search for protect study, you will find its protocol. They already have a paper published from the work they have done. Their study is not yet complete. The results are not known. Make sense? Um, I sir. So we wish we could hear more of what the people want to say. But since we're nearing seven and the meeting would run out, if it's okay with you, we could start wrapping up now. Well, I'm, I'm entirely at your disposal. I'm happy to finish if that's what you think is a good idea. Okay. Thank you so much for taking out your time for this amazing lightning session. It was such a novel experience. And uh, I personally, I'd say I really learned a lot from this. And I'm sure everyone else would, uh, would think likewise as well. So thank you so much for taking out time for this. And thank you for making it open for all medical students across Pakistan. It, it, would, it was a really nice learning opportunity. And we're so glad that you want to um, invest your time in um, for the helping out people from Pakistan, across Pakistan. So we're really grateful for that. And it was a wonderful session. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. No worries. It was a pleasure having you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.